And due to the explosion of computing power, more and more machines are now being designed to think for themselves. Like these modular robots called superbots. Every module, if needed, can become a brain to control others. And they can detect where they are in the body. Basically, they use their infrared and they have a six-way communication with their neighbors. They will say, do I have a neighbor on my right-hand side or my left-hand side? A module detect it is an arm, it will perform like an arm. If it's detected in the leg, it will perform as a leg. These are just prototypes. The next generation of superbots will be able to assess their environment independently and decide for themselves what shape would be best. It will change its shape to become a snake in order to go through a very narrow place. Or it can change the shape to have legs to grab things and climb down certain things. So eventually we can have them perform different tasks in different environment. So that's our, uh, our grand goal for this project. Up to now, robots' ability to think and act autonomously has been limited by two major hurdles. The first is pattern recognition. Robots can see. They can see better than us. But they don't understand what they are seeing. They can't recognize objects very well. And the second is even more important. Robots can hear. Robots can hear much better than us, but they don't necessarily understand what they are hearing. Yet this may be about to change. Here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, researchers have recently made a breakthrough. They have created a machine with object recognition skills by combining computer science with neuroscience. Our work has been motivated mainly by trying to understand the neuroscience of the brain, how the brain works. If you understand how a part of intelligence works, you should be able to recreate it in machines. The MIT team designed a computer that emulates the way the brain processes visual information. The machine was then shown hundreds of sample images of common objects like buildings, vehicles, animals, or plants. Afterwards, the machine was shown images of street scenes that contain those objects. The question was whether it would recognize them. The results were astounding. The computer succeeded in finding 78% of the objects. It did that surprisingly well, I, I should say, um, much better than I would have thought. Intelligence is the ability to learn to recognize objects in difficult situations, and I am excited about this discovery. Research into artificial intelligence is at a turning point. In the coming decades, machines will gradually approach human-level intelligence. What kind of relationship will we develop with such intelligent machines? To find out, I've traveled to the country my family came from, Japan. My parents grew up in the Shinto and Buddhist tradition. And in Shintoism, there are gods and spirits which inhabit all things, even inanimate things like machines and even robots. And in Buddhism, the emphasis is on harmony, not conflict, not domination, but living in harmony with the world. So the Japanese people conceive robots as friends, companions, and even confidants. Welcome, Dr. Kaku. Glad to meet you, Esimo. I'll show you to the table. Uh, my pleasure. It's no surprise that the most advanced humanoid robot, Asimo, 
has been developed here in Japan. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule to visit us. Uh, no problem. I'll bring you something to drink. While Asimo can recognize obstacles and pre-registered faces, most of what it says and does is pre-programmed. Please take a seat. Okay, I will. Please excuse me. And yet, Asimo has one very important skill. It can walk and move like a human. I stopped walking. We take it for granted that we can walk. We don't even think about it. In fact, it's an extremely complex task. It took the engineers at Honda 20 years of research to achieve Asimo's human-like movements. Asimo is one of the most advanced robots in the world when it comes to walking, when it comes to running, when it comes to mobility. Things that were once considered impossible, Asimo can do. So Asimo is an engineering marvel. Realize that five, ten years ago, a robot that could walk with this sophistication was beyond reach. Because Asimo's looks and moves are so strikingly similar to a human, I don't see in it just a machine. I came for delivery. Well, thank you. I brought you orange juice. Mm -hmm. I know Asimo is a machine. Thank you so much. But I find myself relating to it as though it was a real person. The more lifelike the machine, the more we will develop an emotional bond with it. And the more we will tend to interact with it. Yet what will happen when, increasingly, the machines interact with us? These children are visiting the world's largest robot museum in the Japanese city of Nagoya. Some of the robots on display here are especially designed to foster an emotional bond with humans. This is the Sony Aibo, in other words, Robo-Pet. The Sony Aibo can register about six different emotions like hunger, distress, pain. When you want to pet the dog, it registers pleasure. You pet it on its back, you tickle its ears, or you tickle its chin. Kimochi. And when it runs out of electricity, it shows that it's hungry. The children here clearly love toys like Aibo. Their reaction gives an insight into our future relationship with robots. I remember showing some Australian children once a film of a robot called Curio, which apparently means curiosity, and this Curio is amazing. Not only can it walk up and down stairs and sit down and write itself and so on,